Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Greetings, my name's Jeff Ross. I'm one of the associate pastors here at the Roswell United Methodist Church. Thanks for tuning in to uh, this time of worship. Um, our scripture for today is Psalm 104, verses 24 to 34. And it says this, How many are your works, Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, and vast and spacious, and it's teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. There the ships go to and fro, and there's a leviathan which you formed to frolic there. All the creatures look to you to give them their food at the proper time. And when you give it to them, they gather it up. And when you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. And when you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created. And you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. Let us pray. God, yes, let our meditation today be pleasing to you as we rejoice in you and as we celebrate this Pentecost Sunday. For it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, again, uh, thanks for tuning in today. Uh, and this is Pentecost. Uh, this is what many consider to be the birthday of the church. Uh, the story of Pentecost is found in the second chapter of Acts, uh, and we'll get to that in, in just a minute. But I like this psalm, and this psalm, 104, is part of the lectionary text for uh, this Pentecost Sunday. And I believe it's one of the texts because it talks about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit uh, is guiding us and how the Holy Spirit helps us to think about uh, how we live our life. And so that's what I want us to kind of look at. Uh, the writer, <laughs> uh, to me, this is a fun passage because it sounds like the writer uh, has discovered everything again uh, uh, in a joyous way. Uh, the, the, the psalm is full of joy and of hope and of expectation and renewal. Um, and so it starts off, if you go back to verse 1, it starts off saying, God, you are great. You are awesome. And then it looks like the writer goes outside and is just blown away by everything that they see. And the writer says, light, 
oh my gosh, that's a wonderful thing. What a great gift. And look up there, clouds. Clouds are an awesome thing. They're beautiful. And then uh, the writer sees water and goes, water? Well, what a great thing. And look how it divides and sort of organizes land and water. And, and then mountains, kind of off in the horizon maybe. Gosh, those are incredible. And then uh, the, the writer picks sort of an odd grouping of things to be excited about. Uh, the first thing the writer is excited about after the uh, 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 land and water and clouds and light is donkeys. Uh, the writer says, donkeys? Oh my gosh, fascinated with donkeys, I guess. But then birds and grass and cattle. <laughs> and then down in verse 15, the writer says, wine. Oh, what a great gift wine is. Um, I'm, I'm imagining that maybe they started their day with a little too much of wine, and that's why the tenor of this uh, passage is what it is. But then the writer uh, continues exploring the world. Trees and storks and goats. Oh my gosh. Then moon. Look how the moon comes out at night to give light. Just a little bit of light and then the darkness goes away and in the morning is the sun and light and oh my gosh that's incredible. It is. It seems to be if you read it that way. A psalm of great joy and hope and expectation and renewal. And I wonder if that's the point of the psalm and why it's attached to Pentecost is that maybe that's the way in which we could be living our lives. If we got up in the morning and sort of dusted the sleep out of our eyes and then walked around our, our house and said, oh my gosh, a table. That's a great thing. And look, chairs to go with the table. Oh, wonderful. And carpet to keep our feet warm. And look, a television to keep up with other people. And a coffee maker. Oh my gosh, that's the best thing in the whole world. And so all of this leads to verse 30 of this psalm. Uh, psalm 104. When the writer says, when you send your spirit, God, we are created and renewed. And so there's a, kind of an assumption there, isn't there? When you send your spirit. Well, you're going to send it, but we don't know exactly when and how. And so for me, that, that's kind of the point of this passage and of Pentecost and what we're going to look at today. Uh, God doesn't act in big demonstrative ways all the time. And so in the in-between times, what's our role? What's our part? How do we live? How do we uh, live in reverence and in worship to God? And so the writer's going to talk about that. Uh, but the problem is for us, for many of us, for our culture, um, uh, for hu humans in general, is that we don't like this word when. We don't like the ambiguity of it. We want something more predictable. We want a formula. We want somebody to be able to tell us, okay, here's how you uh, usher in God's Spirit. Here's how you can grab it and bring it to your event. If you're going to plan a big worship service or a, some sort of celebration, you want to ensure that the Holy Spirit's going to come in powerful ways because that makes more of a splash for people. And so we want to know how to access it and, and how to get it. Uh, and that's just kind of the, the people that we are. My, uh, my wife, Sherry, is a wonderful cook, tremendous cook. And so she loves to watch cooking shows and uh, uh, baking contest shows, Chef John, other uh, cooking shows. And they're very organized. They're very helpful because they usually have a link at the bottom of the page that you're watching uh, for the recipe. And the recipe is a detailed document that tells you how to recreate uh, what you're seeing on television. There, there's a description of the utensils or equipment that you'll need, the ingredients that you'll need, how much of which ingredient to put in. Uh, it, it tells you when to add these ingredients, how to mix the ingredients. It tells you what temperature to set the oven at and how long uh, to leave it in the oven. Uh, and then at the end, it shows you a picture of what it ought to look like. Um, 
And that's so nice and orderly. It's something we can follow. It's something that we could say, hey, I want this. And so I can go in the kitchen and create this. And we like that in our lives uh, because a lot of us have engineers or architects or administrators as part of our personality. We, we want to see things uh, in the, this orderly, planned out way. But Psalm 104 doesn't offer that, does it? And uh, even Acts chapter 2, we'll get to in a second, doesn't offer that as well. It simply says in Psalm 104, when? And that leaves it totally up to God to decide how and when and where God's going to move and how God is going to act. And it's not for us to control. It's, it's not a recipe. It's not a formula for us to go and say, okay, God, I need you. I command you to show up or do your thing here at this particular time and place. The closest thing we have to a recipe Uh, is in Acts chapter 2. And Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 1, simply describes what happens on that first uh, Pentecost uh, Sunday, Uh, but it doesn't tell us how to recreate it. Let's let's take a look. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly the sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now that, for, for those of you looking for a formula or, or ability to recreate this, it's, it's problematic because the only recipe things uh, in the list are that they were gathered in one place So we could duplicate that. We're gathered in one place uh, and that they were sitting. And everything else, though, was left up to God to do. They were gathered in one place sitting and then suddenly something happened. Suddenly the wind begins to blow in a violent way uh, and this Holy Spirit came as uh, 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 tongues of fire seem to touch each person. Now that part we can't do. That part we have no control over. We have uh, no ability to replicate or duplicate that at all uh, in our worship time or this um, Pentecost Sunday. And so only God can do that. So when the psalmist says, when God sends the Holy Spirit, It's an admission that only God can do that. And so we say, okay, uh, what is then our part? How do we act? How do we live? How do we go about our day-to-day life? And so that's that's where the, the psalmist continues. This was all sort of acted out recently in a in an amazing event that took place uh, in February uh, at the campus of Asbury Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky. Seems that around the middle of February, a group of students uh, had gathered after the morning chapel service. Many folks had gone to lunch. A few folks stayed at the altar and were praying. Uh, after lunch, the band came back uh, to pick up and pack up their instruments, uh, and they noticed these folks still praying at the altar, so they started playing, just as background music to sort of help uh, set the mood or tone as folks prayed. Well, that uh, lasted an hour, two hours, three hours, a whole day, another day, another day, two whole weeks this lasted, and news of it spread all over the country, and so folks came from everywhere uh, to see what was happening on the campus of Asbury Seminary. Um, And I'm sure that some of those folks wanted to experience and see what happens, but I'm also sure that many people came to figure out what were the formula, what was the recipe for how this started so that they could take that back to their church, their campus, their place of worship, uh, and duplicate this amazing, powerful event. Well, after two weeks, the seminary sort of closed this down because Wilmore, Kentucky is a small town and thousands of people were coming and it was disrupting uh, the whole community. 
And so at that time, a couple of folks tried to take what was there and move it to a new location uh, to continue what was taking place. The thing that happened, though, again, we're t- we, we have to wait and trust on God when God sends His Spirit. Uh, when it moved off campus, it, it didn't last. This revival, this amazing uh, uh, act of God and the Holy Spirit didn't duplicate itself in other places. Folks that came so that they could learn and take it back to their place, from what I've been able to read and discover, there's some good things that happened. Uh, People were inspired and uh, hope and joy was added, but nobody has been able to recreate this on their own campus as a result of having to having had visited Asbury. So we're left with a couple of questions, right? Well, so what was happening at Asbury? Why Asbury? Why that place? Why that time? Those are all good questions, and we'd love to have the answers for. The problem is when God sends His Spirit, we just don't have control over and we don't have, we're not privy to the mind of God and to how those decisions are made. And so we're left to wonder, are the students at Asbury better? Are they more holy? Uh, are they more doubt, devout? Are they more special? Uh, are they more blessed? Did they make better marks in their theology classes? Uh, were they more spiritual? All of those are are great things to ponder, but the reality probably is that none of that. It was just that God decided that the Spirit was going to move in that place at that time. There was no recipe or no, no formula, at least that anybody's been able to figure out up to now. When I was in college, I decided to go into the ministry, and I wanted all the tools that were available to me that God was offering. And so one night I was watching TV, and there was a televangelist that was saying, after we come back from the break, I'm going to show you how to receive the Holy Spirit. Well, I thought, well, maybe there's something I don't have here, so I need it. And so after the break, I tuned in, and the the preacher said, put your hands on the television and start to pray. And after a few minutes, you'll receive the Holy Spirit. So that's what I did. I put my hands on the TV. I was in my dorm room. I felt kind of silly, but I said, you know, what the heck? Uh, if this works, it'll be great. Uh, and if not, then I would just feel silly for a little while. And so for a while, I, I prayed, had my hands on the TV and nothing happened. And it, and it was almost after a while like God was chuckling <laughs> and, and said, I could feel God's spirit uh, say to me, Jeff, Jeff, this is silly. You don't need to do this. This is not how you receive uh, anything from me. I, I've not created an obstacle course. Uh, I've not created a riddle uh, where it's hard for folks to capture what it is that that I'm offering. Trust me, you have everything that you need. And as you go into the ministry, I will guide you. I will be with you. Well, that was a a powerful thing in and of itself. Uh, But again, uh, and I'm sure some folks were helped with that, Uh, But there is no formula. I can't tell you what you have to do. And if you do these six steps, here's how your life will change. Uh, We're we're all different. In fact, if you look through the Bible, uh, that couldn't be more clearer. Um, Gideon is nothing like David. Deborah was way different than Ruth. Abraham was clearly not Moses. Uh, and in church tradition, John Wesley was in, in many uh, ways exactly the opposite of John Calvin. Uh, John Newton, who uh, wrote the, the hymn Amazing Grace, had a despicable early life uh, uh, before coming to his senses and coming to faith and writing Amazing Grace. But St. Francis of Assisi was basically a saint from the day he was born. 
And so people come in all kinds of different ways and paths. There's no central thing that everybody has to do uh, to receive this Holy Spirit. When God sends God's Spirit, it's, it's up to God to send that Spirit. We, we want to know how to bring the Spirit, and I, I think that's our need, isn't it? It's our need to control things. It has to do with our desire maybe to be God. Uh, we don't want to be the people of God. Uh, we want to be the God of other people. We don't like that God often is in charge, and we also don't like to wait. And so this whole idea of when the Spirit comes, uh, embedded in that is this idea of waiting and patience. And so that's why I love the end of this psalm, Psalm 104, because the writer says, I will sing and I will meditate. And it seems like, and I will also go outside and marvel at the clouds and the mountains and water and goats and donkeys and the Leviathan that God created to frolic in the ocean. I'm not in control of when. There's not a formula. But while I wait for these big events like Pentecost and the revival at Asbury, I can sing. I can worship, I can meditate, and really, that's good. That's good enough for me. Let us pray. God, we love to be in control of things. Uh, we love to be in charge. We love to tell other folks what to do. We, we love to share our knowledge. Here's what you do, and here's how you do it, and this is all you need to do. But some things just don't fit in those kind of formulas. And so we're thankful for this writer. We're thankful for your spirit, God, that does move. And we see in so many different ways uh, your acting and your moving and your working in people's lives here at Roswell Methodist Church and around the world uh, through our church and other churches and people uh, all around the world, what, God, what you're doing. And we, we pray that you'll continue to move and shake and that we'll uh, be smart enough to, to wait and be aware of what you're doing and join in and not thwart how your spirit works and moves. God, our world needs a great movement by your Spirit. And we come today on this Pentecost Sunday praying, God, asking uh, for you to move and to work in mighty ways. Continue to use this church. Continue to guide us in how we respond. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock 
in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir, an organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.